So, our speaker tonight is Dr. Linda Kennedy, who has been a longtime resident of Arizona, now Southern Arizona, for a number of years. However, she is a native of Kansas, and I will give you a little background on what Linda has been involved with in her life. She graduated from Port Hayes State University, and uh, where she received a Bachelor of Science and Master, Master of Science degree in biology. She went on to earn a doctorate in biology and botany from Arizona State University, uh, which uh, makes her a very accomplished botanist, obviously. Um, she was on the staff of the Appleton Little Research Ranch from 1999 until she retired in 2018. Before launching her career as a biologist, however, she was a bookkeeper at the First National Bank in Kensington, Kansas. So she had a little career switch there from her original um, career path. Uh, Linda and her husband, uh, Dan Robinette, who was also a very well-known botanical person in, in Arizona, uh, retired from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, after more than 30 years as a rangeland management specialist. And he and she share their love of open spaces, which is a nice place to be if you do that, and especially uh, grasslands. Uh, and their blended family, which now uh, includes 11, I count them, grandchildren. So that's what uh, the little background information on, on Linda. And I found Linda since moving to Arizona about 12 years ago. And she's been just a great supporter of the Native Plant Society and has been involved with a number of very interesting little projects in that regard. Okay, well, Linda's going to talk to us about where she spent the last 18 or so years, I guess the Audubon Ranch and um, give us some interesting background on this very um, unique place. Okay, well, thank you, Doug. And thank all of you for tuning in tonight and giving me a chance to say hi to some, well, I won't say old friends, I'll say friends from before the pandemic and uh, say hi to some new friends out there and, uh, and giving me the chance to introduce everyone to the research ranch if they haven't already had an introduction. Okay, for those of you who have uh, seen one of my presentations before, you might pick up that on this uh, opening screen, there is a little bit of a difference from my previous presentations. Down there at the bottom, I've got Dr. Linda Kennedy. I don't use Dr. Linda Kennedy even when I was uh, speaking professionally, I seldom used Dr. Linda Kennedy, but I'm doing it tonight in honor of and solidarity with our incoming uh, First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden. So thank you for putting up with Dr. Linda Kennedy for tonight. After that, I'm back to Linda, okay? So I'd like to tell you about a place that is really special to me. It's the uh, now known as the Appleton Hotel Research Ranch of the National Audubon Society. It is a ranch without cows. So where is the ranch? Most of you probably uh, don't need the full screen state of Arizona to show where the, the uh, ranch is. We're just south of Elgin a little ways and uh, on the other side of the uh, Huachuca Mountains from, from Sierra Vista. I was there for 18 years in administration, turned it over to a wonderful bunch of young people. Uh, Christina Francois in the middle here is the director. Uh, Suzanne Wilcox, I hired her years ago as an office manager. Now she's programs office operation manager. And Ben Beal is the conservation program manager. These young people bring a wealth of energy and enthusiasm. And uh, it's been, been great to see what they've, the direction that they're taking the research ranch. And I thought for those of you who've not been on the research ranch, I'd just give you a few scenery shots to just let you know 
the tough place I had to work. I mean, it was really rough to have to go to work. Plus I lived there. It's beautiful there, but that's not what makes the research ranch special. There are a lot of beautiful places in Southeast Arizona. Gonna give you just a little bit of regional background on this. You're, you're Cochise residents, Santa Cruz residents. So you probably already know a lot of, of this, but quite often at the research ranch, I was asked by people or, or told by people that it was so wonderful to have a pristine environment there. And when I drilled down a little bit more into what they meant by pristine, it was usually without human impact. That's not the research ranch. It's not Southeast Arizona. There've been humans here for, for a long, long time. And we all had influences, sometimes one kind of influence, some kind, sometimes another. Native Americans um, overlapped with the Mexican Spanish influence for, um, for a couple of hundred years. And then in 1983 and 84, this part of Arizona became part of the United States of America through the Gadsden Treaty or Gadsden Purchase. That brought on uh, a whole new set of, of impacts, of influences, but it was delayed a little bit until after the Civil War because uh, Frankly, Americans were busy fighting each other rather than, than expanding. But after the Civil War, there were several things that contributed to, uh, to alteration of this ecosystem. One was there was a military presence in large enough um, and well-trained enough condition that the Apaches were subdued. Railroads were brought into the area Windmills uh, allowed water to be uh, provided in rather dry areas. Barbed wire had a huge influence because that allowed people, settlers, ranchers, to claim land. And one thing that I never heard about watching all those cowboy shows as a child was the amount of capital that flowed into this area from the Eastern United States and even Europe. All of these things contributed in, lar to, in large part to a huge growth in livestock. Now the um, Spaniards had brought in livestock, but at the small enough numbers, they didn't really have much of an ecological impact. But you put all of these things together, plus just, just think about it for a minute, folks. What would you have done if right after the Civil War, you'd been displaced from where you lived? Your, your farm in the east or the south was destroyed. Uh, you headed west and you came over a ridge and you saw grass as clear up to your horse's belly for as far as you could see. I know what I'd have thought. And that's what many of them thought too. They thought it was cow heaven. And the livestock um, population, in addition to Anglo-American uh, population, boomed. But let me tell you something about this area. Here are just a few of the native herbivores, native to southeastern Arizona. We all know, our, know and more or less love the javelina several kinds of deer, a lot of insects. But what's missing from this bunch? Bison, that analog to domestic cattle. If you see here on this um, uh, map from Pruitt, the crosshatch or the shaded line is approximately the line of bison range from the Great Plains. As you can see, there were some archeological remains over in Arizona, 
but it was thought that those were either stray animals or that had uh, bones or skulls had been gotten, uh, acquired through trade. The bison, if they were here, were at such a low level, that they didn't have much of an ecological impact. And if you remember that previous slide, some people feel that the group that had the most impact on our native ecosystem were grasshoppers. So we've got cows, lots of cows, but we have an environment here that is different than any of the environments that uh, all those ranchers came from. And what we saw was a, a proliferation of cattle in the good years leading to overgrazing and then crashes. And then proliferation, overgrazing, bad years, crashes. Now let's fast forward uh, a few decades to the uh, late 1950s and early 1960s, keeping all that information about, about cows and this ecosystem in mind. Um, a family named Frank and Ariel Appleton and their four children decided it was time to live out their idea of the American dream, which was a cattle ranch at the end of the road in the American West. And they found two small cattle ranches and bought them in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, and the private land and the grazing allotments from the Forest Service and Arizona State Trust Land Department gave them about an 8,000 acre cattle ranch to work with. Now, to me coming from Kansas, an 8,000 acre cattle ranch sounds enormous, but it wasn't. Not for, not for this area. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more if we have time. But they, the Appletons were not ranchers, but they did the smart thing. They hired a professional ranch manager, one that had gone through Texas A&M um, and was fully in tune with their wish to run a cattle ranch in an ecological sound fashion. And so that's how the Elgin Hereford Cattle Ranch began. However, it really didn't take them long at all to realize that raising cattle out here was a risky, hard business. And it really wasn't, uh, really wasn't all that profitable. Fortunately, the Appalachians had two things going for them. They had enough money that they didn't have to depend on the calf crop to, uh, to pay the mortgage or to pay the expenses. In addition to that, they had a vision. They could see what was missing. They sold their cows. They started a nonprofit, which became the Research Ranch Foundation. And they talked the, a state entity and a government agency into buy, buying into a huge experiment. Let's take the cows off and let's see what happens to the land when those cows are gone. And then let's let natural processes take over. That was, that was, 1968, folks, that was radical. They were out there. And here's a couple of, uh, I've read a lot of their work. Here's a couple of quotes from, from Frank and Ariel that really seem to symbolize what was on their mind. We've come to realize there is a great gap in understanding what is helpful and is what is harmful to land. So there was a lot that people simply didn't know. And we thought that there must be a higher use for it, the ranch, than just livestock operation. So they ran the research ranch for about 10 years on their own. 
and found out that it was very, very difficult, very expensive. Um, and also they felt that they wanted, but they knew it was valuable and they wanted to find a conservation organization that could carry on the vision that they'd had for this property. And so in 1968, the Research Ranch Foundation was active. The Forest Service was a partner. State Trust Land Department was a partner. And National Audubon Society became a partner. And there below is the Hotel Foundation became a partner. And we'll get to that in just a second. First, why Audubon? Why would a, an organization known for bird conservation want to take over the management responsibilities for an 8,000 acre former cattle ranch in southeastern Arizona? Well, the if I've got any birders in the audience, and I'm pretty darn sure I do, you, you may know, you may have read, because not, no one here is old enough to remember that, but back in the uh, 70s, it was determined that one of the assemblages of birds that were really suffering were those that were obligately dependent on grasslands for some to complete some or all of their life stages. So the opportunity to, to take over management of an 8,000 acre primarily grassland facility was very attractive, but Audubon is a nonprofit. They certainly didn't have the money to run it. And that's where the Hotel Foundation stepped in and they provided a, an endowment. Uh, that endowment is st still provides a significant portion of the operating budget of the research ranch. And that's how it became the Appleton Quittel Research Ranch of the National Audubon Society. Currently, the partners include the foundation, the Forest Service, Audubon, the Hotel Foundation, and other land managers. Um, the Bureau of Land Management uh, did a land swap with state trust land. The Nature Conservancy joined in down here, and uh, Swift Current Land and Cattle Company in, um, in 2005 purchased the remaining Appleton property. And they are uh, as conservation land that will be used at some point in time to, uh, for trade for land that is valuable for mining. And at which time the Swift Current land will become uh, managed as part of BLM ownership, but it will still be part of the research ranch. So what does the research ranch do? Well, first of all, conservation is, is hugely important. And although letting natural pro, uh, processes take charge is the guiding principle, sometimes you gotta be able to give mother nature a boost. And sometimes you need to know what's the best thing to do. And that's where research comes in because there's a whole lot we don't know about taking care of, of grasslands, prairies in the, uh, the Southwest. And that's where our own monitoring and uh, research from outside entities fit in. Then, then is outreach. Now we could have the very best 8,000 acres in the US. We could have the very best research program in the US. But if we don't take that a step farther and get it out to other people, the research ranch is failing and part of its mission because it's, it's to be a a demonstration of what can be done. We all know from our, our high school biology days that every experiment 
should have a control. Or if, it, if it's an ecological study and you can't have a control, you need a reference area by which to compare that experiment to. And bringing on the cattle, like we did, was a huge ecological experiment. We brought in a factor to a naive ecosystem. And the Appletons realized that what this area needed wasn't another small cattle ranch, but a place to compare cattle ranching to non-cattle ranching. So comparison to other land uses was big and also changes through time. What would happen on the research ranch after the cows came off? Now you might think that this was an anti-cow movement. And it was definitely not. It wasn't when the Appletons ran it. It wasn't when Audubon took over management. The guiding principle was, there was let the data speak. Collect good data, appropriate data, sound data, and then let it speak. Well, so what? A few of the cross-fence comparisons um, that have been done are on native and non-native plants, ungrazed, grazed, small mammals, birds, we're Audubon, of course there's lots of bird work, and reptiles, okay. changes over time. This um, photo was taken, um, 30 years after grazing ceased. You can see my, the outline of the research ranch here. And our neighboring cattle ranches are known as pretty darn good cattle ranches. But still, it was obvious that there was a fence line difference. Now you might notice right here in the middle of the research ranch, there's a a white area that uh, shows a lot of bare ground. Those were some controlled fires done that year. Okay. So changes over time. Uh, photography has played a role in, in checking on the changes over time. Now, photography is not that great at picking up herbaceous changes, but it does pick up changes on um, woody species. And this, these two sets of photos here were done by Ray and Janine Turner. Some of you may know, uh, are familiar with Ray's uh, credentials as an ecologist. And uh, you can see the difference in the number and of trees. Not much difference in the size of trees. These are nearly all oaks. But um, there are significant changes over time. Topics of study, it's broad, but early on the, the focus was on the impacts of grazing by domestic livestock on vegetation and on critters. Later, there became a number of uh, studies done on the effects of fire, exurbanization, the shift of rangeland into ranchettes and small uh, acreages, uh, a lot of species or organismal work, and a lot of associations or relationship work. More recently, the big shift has been all of these things with an overlay of what's happening in today's uh, world with climate change. Who's doing this work? The uh, endowment that was established by the Hotel Foundation to support the research ranch specifically precludes spending that, any of that income on research. It can be used to support research, but it cannot be used for research. Uh, so that means that all of the projects have to be self-funded either by Audubon staff, university staff, agency personnel, and, um, and vetted 
by that was that was my one of my jobs on the research ranch was to make sure that any research application fit the criteria for the research ranch that it was good sound science that would help us answer the questions of what's going on here how do we take get better care of this land what do we have here how is it changing and so in 2017, the last annual report that I prepared as a director, there were 19 active research projects conducted by eight federal agencies, one state agency, five um, non-governmental organizations, nine private uh, folks, either LLCs or individuals. We had two high school students doing really nice research on the research ranch. In addition, we had um, 18 colleges and universities represented. Now, I mentioned that we couldn't use money from the endowment to support research. And that, to me, was a big gap in, in what the research ranch could do because we couldn't really recruit research. So we started a fellowship program that we could, um, it's small, but it's growing, uh, could actually support or, or provide some funding for college and university students to do research on topics that really fit our needs, ours as the research grant. So just a little bit about what we found on the research grant. One thing, there's a whole lot of biodiversity there. Even though there's not a big elevation change and native water is limited, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. There were 38 species of grasshopper, and I know Ben has added at least two more since then. 231 species of bird had been identified as using the research ranch at some point in their, their life cycle. And 46 mammal species had been found on the research ranch, native mammal species. 54 reptile and amphibians had been found on the research ranch. And plants, yay, I'm a botanist. That's what I was there for. So I was really excited to be a part of the uh, the plant research there. I was not alone. According to the last um, published work, and at the time I put this together, the most up-to-date nomenclature, there were 82 families, plant families represented, 322 genera, 612 species. Now I've put more or less because some of those species are coming and going, but there are a lot of kind of plants out there. So let's put that into perspective. In 2011, I was invited to give, um, try and condense a, uh, the research ranch into a 10 minute talk uh, at a symposium put on by the Santa Rita Experimental Range, which is a a facility associated with the University of Arizona. The first speaker that evening was Dr. Mitch McLaren, who um, was the research director of the uh, experimental range. And he very proudly did a, showed a comparison of the Santa Rita experimental range that had 468 species, meaning 500 or I'm sorry, 5.6 species per square mile to uh, other published floras, the Rincon Mountains, just under five species per square mile, Tucson Mountain, almost four species per square mile. Okay, folks, I was sitting in the, the audience and grabbed the pencil and did a little quick math. Here's from Mitch's slide, and here's what I added. The research ranch has, had found 612 species. It was only 13 square miles. That means we had 47 
species per square mile compared to four at the Tucson Mountains, five at the Rincons, and about five and a half on the Santa Rita. I was pretty pumped. Um, but realistically, that does not mean that the research grant really has a lot more species per square mile. What it means is the research ranch had a different focus. Okay. The Santa Rita Experimental Range, that was, that was uh, established to help find ways to grow cows on desert grasslands. Okay. The Rincon Mountains and the Tucson Mountains, both of those floras were done by people who didn't live there, who went out there and spent some time there came back and wrote a paper. We lived on the research ranch. We wanted to know everything about the research ranch, not just what the cows were eating. So some of those plants, uh, and I won't show you all 416 of them, or 612 of them, because I didn't get them all photographed, but I'll show you a few um, that I thought are especially nice. The uh, one of the species was uh, the little wheel milkweed, one of the little dwarf milkweeds. You can see the dime down here at the bottom compared to these. Uh, that was discovered while I was on the research ranch. And uh, it is still, as far as I know, the farthest south representation of that species in the US. Tiny little thing blooms early in the spring and then by early in the summer, you can't find it. So if you don't find it when it's in flower, you gotta wait till the next year. Uh, 10 species of, I don't know if I can ever get around to thinking about agaves being in, in asparagaceae, but I'll try. Um, this is agave perii variety of Wachugaensis. Lots of asters. And most of them, or at least a good share of them, are yellow asters, like this Xanthocephalum gymnospermoides. Isn't that, doesn't that just roll off your tongue? It sounds a lot better than San Pedro matchweed, but San Pedro matchweed is easier to spell. A pretty good representation of cactus, although nearly all of them are small cactus. Lots of euphorbs. This is one of my favorites, whether you call it poinsettia radians or euphorbia radians. Uh, I can't get used to calling it sun spurge. That just sounds like some sort of a skin disease. I, I much prefer to call it desert poinsettia, even though that's not the approved common name. Lots of members of the Fabaceae family. Only two members in the lily family. And of course, you see why I picked this one to show. Not only is it a pretty plant, but Calicordus candidii, how could I resist? But of course, it wasn't named after me. And here's my group of organisms. Plants, grasses, yeah, poaceae. Uh, at uh, that, I probably still current 109 species. So uh, more than a sixth of the flora of the research ranch are uh, grass species. And 90% of those are native grasses. And here's a few of the pretty ones. And here's one that isn't so pretty, but let me tell you, kids love it when you introduce a, a tangle head plant to them. And some of them pop up in the strangest places like this Bothria chloridii, the Wright's beard grass. No one expected it to be out there. Okay, let's circle back around to what the Appletons had in, in mind, what their vision was and their need. We've come to realize there's a great gap in understanding what is helpful and harmful. We thought there must be a higher use for the ranch than just livestock operation. Have we succeeded? Did they succeed? Quite often, when I was at the research ranch, people would ask me, what is the most important thing that has been found on the research ranch? And for some of them, that's kind of a disappointment. 
I guess they assumed I would come up with a um, charismatic, rare charismatic megafauna, but that wasn't it. To me, the most important result was that when the Appletons took the cattle off the research, put the research ranch, it was classed as a short grass prairie where the dominant grasses are between two and 24 inches tall. That's, that's one of the definitions of a short grass prairie. By the mid eighties, researchers were starting to point out that there was a change in the vegetation community. It, they didn't feel it was a full blown short grass prairie anymore. They thought it was trending towards a mixed grass prairie. And then in uh, early 2000s, a definitive publication came out by McLaughlin and Bowers and Geiger that said, not only is this a mixed grass prairie, but it's a mixed grass prairie that is unlike the mixed grass prairies of the, of the Great Plains. It has more affinities with uh, south of the border. It's a Madrian mixed grass prairie where the dominant grasses are eight inches to four feet tall. So that concept and why it's important to me was the management implications therein. And I've uh, just a couple more quotes from, from a neighboring rancher. As a former ranch manager in the area, I found the opportunity to compare a site I was concerned with to an ungrazed site on the research very useful. And from an Arizona game and fish habitat specialist, she used the research ranch as a standard for wildlife habitat. She said, you can't expect someplace else to actually perform better than it, they can, than it can be done at the research ranch. And now Audubon as a conscientious non-governmental organization routinely did company-wide check-ins where you have to to prove what you're doing. And one year it came out and they wanted measurable conservation impacts. They wanted metrics, not just generalization. And I talked to the person that was putting this together and he said, now's a good time for hyperbole. Well, you might remember that my background was in bookkeeping and then as a researcher. Uh, neither one lends itself really to hyperbole. So I went to the experts. I went to two agency folks, two different departments, two different agencies that had done research on the ranch and had used that research and our monitoring work to develop standards and guidelines. And I asked them, and this is what they came back with. These are the metrics I was able to turn into Audubon that the research ranch had directly influenced over 200,000 acres and over 2.5 million acres influenced in part. We blew them away, we blew them away. Folks, here's my sunset slide to the research ranch. It's a beautiful place. It was a wonderful place to do research, to live, to work, met wonderful people. And it was a special place but it wasn't a special place because it was beautiful. It was a special place because of the Appleton's vision and also because it was ordinary. It was ordinary. It wasn't designed, it wasn't established to protect a particular geologic feature. It wasn't established to protect a rare plant or rare animal. It was established to be a control or a reference area for that 2.5 million acres. And I just think that's pretty special. So thank you for putting up with me, folks. Uh, if you have any questions about the research ranch, here's a, a little bit, uh, there's the contact information for the, uh, the ranch. Sometimes people ask me what the worst thing that I had to do on the research ranch was. That was asked for donations. It's a whole lot easier now that I don't work for the research ranch. If any of you are feeling generous, 
and want to support what the research ranch is, I encourage you to send them a check, $5, $15, whatever you can, can uh, share. And I guarantee they will put it to good use. If you'd like to know more about the background of the research ranch, I recommend uh, a book that's available on Amazon. It's The View from Bald Hill, written by Carl and Jane Bach. And it is a wonderful, wonderful book. If you want to reach out to me and have some questions that maybe you don't want to ask tonight, uh, there's my email address down at the bottom. As you can tell, I love talking about the research ranch. Thanks again for indulging in one of my passions. And uh, now if there are any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much, Linda. That was great. I, I do have one in the chat and it's, can the ranch be visited? Uh, yes and no. Right now, all of Audubon's facilities are, are closed to visitation due to the coronavirus. And so that's, that's kind of hanging over them. And, and I don't know when that will be lifted. But other, before that, it was open by appointment only. And so you would need to reach out to Christina at these, these numbers or send them an email and just ask. They are very, um, very willing to, uh, to share the research ranch with interested folks but there are times that it just wouldn't work or there are areas that they can't go to. So you always want to, to reach out to them and say, I'd like to come out um, sometime next week. Would it be possible? And ask for permission. Okay, any other questions? We have a chat question. Um, can the Native Plant Society do a plant walk there? <laughs> I guess that would probably fall into the realm of what you had just said, maybe, Linda. That... Yes, I, um, you know, it's it's no longer my uh, responsibility or uh, or uh, decision, but that's very much uh, consistent with with what the research ranch does, and so I would uh, say I would hazard a guess that Christina would would work with you on that, sure. and. Um, a couple of things I would mention as having led many things. Size is important. If you get too many people, you don't get to see as many things. So it might be better to, to have um, several groups or several trips or else have several leaders. And uh, I would be glad to, to be one of the trip leaders uh, for a Native Plant Society trip to the research ranch. But again, it is Christina's uh, call. Hey, Linda, that was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've never been to the research ranch. I really need to go when it's open again. It would be wonderful. I have a question about non-native grasses and what's the status of layman love grass, uh, boars love grass, yellow blue stem, Malinus repens. What, what, do you, what do you guys see out there? Okay. Let's start at the, the bottom and work to the top. Uh, in the tall grass, Melinus, very little. Uh, it uh, started showing up probably about 15 years ago, uh, just a scattered plant here or there, and we were very aggressive about yanking it out. But it's a constant battle. Yellow blue stem, oh, wow, that is, that is a tough one. Uh, it was probably brought into the research ranch on um, vehicles because we found it in uh, primarily along road cuts and water bars. And from the time that a researcher from Oklahoma pointed it out and said that it was a huge problem in Oklahoma, we were combating it. And uh, digging it up, cutting it off, spraying it with, with glyphosate. It's, it's tough, but it is, uh, since we got an early start on it before it really spread very much, uh, I would say it's, I hesitate to say under control, 
but it is not having a major impact on the ecosystem. Now, the other two, boars and layman lovegrass, those were actually planted back in the pre-Appleton days as range improvements. And so right. uh, it was between uh, around, we think between two and 400 acres were planted to those two non-native grasses. In, uh, by 1985, it had spread to 800 acres. By the year 2000, they had spread to be the dominant plant in 2000 acres. We have been fighting them ever since I got there and uh, frankly losing the battle. Uh, yeah. Every time yeah. there is a, a fire, a layman's especially will jump onto that if the, the land is um, amenable to, to being uh, invaded by layman's. Uh, Boars does not spread as fast, but it's, it's still a significant impact. Now, that said, we started really, really protecting several hundred acres of Audubon property because we couldn't use glyphosate on the, uh, the federal land. And where were where we? <laughs> Old, old habits where staff can spend time on it, we can take the native, we can turn it back to native, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of work. And it's kind of like housework, it doesn't stay done. Even after you get it down to a 1% frequency of layman's, you better be out there the next year and check because it can take off on you again. So, um, huge impact to constant struggle. Does that answer your question, Sue? It does. You do a lot more work on it than I was expecting. So that's, that's kudos to you guys. Wow. Um, it, it was, that was one of those things. Is it a natural process to let plants that people planted there from the other side of the world go wild or is it a natural process to try and maintain native plants there and by maintaining the native plants then you maintain the birds the small mammals the reptiles that are associated with those native grassland ecosystems it was a philosophical struggle it really was and after the philosophical struggle, then it's a physical struggle and a financial trouble struggle that they're working on it. Uh, Linda, this is Jim Riggs from Wilcox. Anyway, Hi. and I've been on the on the research range several times with you and Dan, and I don't mm -hmm. know who else up there. But in 2003, our biomodal growing season is basically spring, summer, spring, summer. And mm -hmm. we had gone through four of them where we simply did not, four in a row, but we did not get any rain. And I went out and did topaze transects all over the, our, our place. And uh, on the Holocene, on the deep, deeper loneliest soils, we had uh, in the 75, 85, 95% death loss on our perennial native grasses, primarily blue grandma, sidelix grandma. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the heavier soils up on the Pleistocene that have the, have the heavier uh, things, we were getting anywhere from 50 to 75% death loss. Now, again, those were just topace transects that I was just running all over everywhere. We could still identify the plant that had died. Yeah. Did, did the Audubon's the ranch get anywhere near that at any time on their, and, and has the recovery shown any, any goodness to it? The, the worst experiences that we had, Jim, were during that same time period. Plus, we had a, a fire that ripped through and burned 90% of the research ranch. One of the shortfalls of the research ranch was that unlike our ranching neighbors 
who had established veg vegetation transects like you did, there were no long-term vegetation transects on the research ranch until I got there. And so what we've had to do is compare it to, um, to research uh, publications and research publications and monitoring, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't always uh, link up real good, but we, as best I can tell, we had never seen anything as dire as what you described, even after drought followed by fire, followed by drought. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. Does that your question. Uh, uh, one more comment to follow up. Uh, on the Holocene, on the deeper loamial soils, the layman's just came back just solid in there, and that's all volunteer. We never uh, seeded uh, layman's on the place. But the first year, we didn't get a lot of rain after in 2004, and we had a stand of feather finger grass that was just tremendous. And it laid down as a, as a, as a mulch uh, cover over the soils for up to five years, we could still find that covering over the soil, which, all right, did it hamper the reseeding regeneration on that? Or did it actually help hold some of the moisture in the ground that was there? And it was hard to tell, but um, I didn't know that yours ranch had suffered that quite as bad or not. Of course, we went to, 20 head on our 200 head ranch. So mm. that was just the way it was for a while. We're back up to about 70, 80 head of mother cows now. That's, I'm, I'm glad you were monitoring and realized the issue, Jim, and, and took steps. And that's probably why it's bounced back to where you can have four times as many cows oh. now as you could then. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tell Dan hello. I will. He's. Uh, I asked him if he wanted to sit in, and he said, "Do I need to?" He said, "I've seen your talk." Uh, <laughs> so, so I let him watch the news hour instead. <laughs> well, I've, I've got two other questions here. Um, uh, one is, can you expand a little more on the mining interest near the ranch? And the other one, which might be a little shorter, um, do ranching organizations such as Arizona Cattle Growers make use of the research that's being done? Um, I don't know whether the cattle growers as an organization makes use of the research. I know a number of cattle growers that do because they've talked to me. And one year the, uh, the president of the cattle growers uh, stopped by, he's a, a neighbor, and said, uh, I asked him if there was anything we could do for them. And he said, figure out what to do about lame and love grass. Well, I failed in that. I know individuals do. I don't know if the uh, association does. The mining uh, influence, we do not have any active mining claims within the immediate proximity of the research ranch. There are, of course, a lot up in the Santa Rita's, over in the uh, uh, Patagonia's uh, area, the Canelo's, and down in the foothills of the Huachucas, but not, not that would impact the ecosystems on the ranch. Now, if that was the question, if you're asking about uh, the partner of the research ranch, Resolution Copper, that's a different situation. They bought that land from the Appletons specifically for its conservation value, not for its mining value. Does that answer that question? Hey, Linda, good to hear from you. Excellent presentation. And yes, you did answer my question to the level that I needed it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, just to thank Linda so much for that great talk. What a what a wonderful resource the ranch is and what a great contribution it's made to our understanding of the ecology and the whole environment here in Southern Arizona. Uh, 